Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Ginny Ray Clay. I am the Interim Executive Director of the Social Equity Council. We've got a very exciting uh, Lunch and Learn for you today. And we will doing, we'll be doing a series of these Lunch and Learns and we'll get to you um, a full schedule once we have them completely confirmed and um, ready to go. So today's Lunch and Learn is with Rod Marriott from the Department of Consumer Protection. And Rod is going to be doing a webinar today on the various cannabis license types. Rod, thank you very much for being with us. And I'm gonna turn it all over to you. Uh, thank you, Jenny. I really appreciate you having us and happy to do this today. Um, I'm gonna share my screen, so bear with me a second here. And I wanna make sure everybody can see the screen. Everybody yes. see it okay? Yeah. Yes. Yes, okay, great. All right, so today I'm gonna to go over adult use cannabis licensing information um, and uh, in a general overview. <clears throat> so we'll start with a general overview of the industry and some of the, the restrictions on information here or, and, and product. It's important to understand that a large component of this statute are uh, and public act and, and associated policies and procedures are around cannabis product safety. Um, the products must be lab tested. They must meet strict packaging and labeling standards. They must be in child safe packaging. They must not appeal to children. And their uh, adult use you know, products are gonna have a potency cap, including edible cannabis products limited to a serving size of five milligrams of THC per serving. Another mechanism to help um, ensure safety and control of this program is a seed to sale tracking system or, or really an inventory tracking system that will be in pretty, pretty near to real time. It tracks uh, the cannabis plant from the time that it's uh, put in the ground to the time that it's sold, but it does not collect um, the purchaser information. So one of the key components for any business that's looking to participate in this industry is, is local zoning. There's some particular rules about local zoning that everyone should be aware of here. Um, retailers and micro cultivators uh, re require a special permit or approval from the municipality. Municipalities ha um, have a cap in the statute on how many retailers and micro cultivators that they can have per 25,000 residents. This cap expires uh, in the current public act on June 30th of 2024. This is a map of um, the number of facilities that can be or that are permitted based on that cap. Um, and this map is available on our website. Um, and to kind of just give you an idea of how many retailers and micro cultivators can occur in the municipality. As you can see, the majority are permitted one of each. Um, one of the big differences between the medical marijuana program and the adult use program is their taxes on the adult use product. Um, and here is an example of what the taxes look like. Um, but at the end of the day, you, the Department of Revenue Services covers this <clears throat> with more, more explicitly than, than we will go over here. Um, and we'll, you'd have to reach out for them for specifics. But some of this information will be acquired from the seed to sale tracking system as well. So the adult use market will open um, either when licensed retailers begin operation or licensed producers and cultivators have 250,000 square feet of grow and manufacturing space, at which time facilities that convert to hybrid retailers may begin adult use sales. So um, now we'll kind of go into the different license categories. Um, we've broken the categories out into four different sections. It's kind of growing, manufacturing, sales, and delivery, or transportation of product. So in the growing section, we have producers, um, which are the current 
producers for the medical marijuana program, expanded producers, which are those same folks, um, but uh, working in both markets, medical and adult use, and we'll go more into that later. Cultivators and micro cultivators. In manufacturing, there's product manufacturers, food and beverage manufacturers, and product uh, packagers. The sales generally will be occurring at dispensary facilities, hybrid retailers, and retailers, um, except for some caveats we'll get into after, uh, a little later in the presentation. And then there's delivery, um, and there's delivery services, and then transporters. So all but the star um, types are, are new credentials that will be issued as part of this law. For those of you that have previously attended, um, here's our applications window slide. I believe we displayed this for a similar version of this in the previous um, technical assistance training. Um, this just kind of puts together all the different timelines um, for these, the lotteries um, or, or any other application timeline um, that are prescribed either by us or the statute specifically. We'll go break down the growing uh, credentials now. So the, in general, there's some key things to, to know about the, the cannabis growing industry. Uh, these are generally gonna be significant investments. You're talking you know, larger facilities with specialized equipment, you know, security to keep the, the product where it belongs, um, you know, probably more extensive personnel requirements, um, and then other considerations necessary for grow. So if it's an indoor grow, you know, lighting may be very expensive, water is expensive. Those are things that are really important. And again, you have to meet local zoning requirements and ordinances. So there's two markets. So this, the, the public act created this new market for adult use cannabis. Um, and so now we have two markets where the growing businesses can um, explore and, and, and work in. Um, the medical market uh, has producers and the producers are the only part of the market that have to feed the medical program. The medical and adult use market can be an expanded producer, a cultivator, or a micro cultivator. The existing producer license is, has only been issued to four um, businesses thus far. It can only supply the medical market right now. At this time, we're not looking to add any producers um, and the existing producers may convert to expanded producer licenses, which will allow for them to supply both, both the medical and adult use market um, without entering a lottery. <clears throat> for that expanded producer license, only the licensed producers are eligible. Um, it allows for them to serve both, both markets um, and they have to have a medical preservation um, plan submitted to the department um, for approval. In order for those expanded, those producers to expand, they have to pay a conversion fee of $3 million unless they are participating with two equity joint ventures, at which point the fee is reduced to 1.5 million. Um, they also have to contribute $500,000 to a social to the social equity council, or they have to have evidence of an agreement with the social equity partner. The social equity partner is a unique um, relationship between a current producer and uh, a social equity applicant um, that provides mentorship. The, the expanded producer will provide mentorship, overhead business costs, and 5% of its growth space to the social equity partner. Um, which shall be at least 65% owned and controlled by the individual. Um, and generally, the producer's renewal fee is $75,000 per year. <clears throat> the cultivator license allows for supply to the medical and the adult use market, but the cultivator can choose to, to supply to only one of those. They have to have at least 15,000 square feet uh, at, at the start of their licensure. They cannot sell directly to consumers or through a delivery service. Cultivator licenses um, include the ability to process, um, create food and beverages, and package from their facility, package and label from their facility. <clears throat> there are a couple of different ways for uh, cultivator licenses to be issued. The first one is uh, 
was a specific disproportionately impacted area cultivator license. These um, individuals need to qualify or have a qualified social equity applicant as part of that business structure. There's a one-time application window from February 3rd to May 3rd. The establishment must be located in a disproportionately impacted area. So the business itself has to be located in that area where, where they intend to operate. A $3 million fee is required to participate in the, the DIA cultivator license um, for provisional license. And that um, is a fee to the social equity council specifically. Um, there's a, a potential for a lottery to occur uh, for the cultivator licenses, although none have been scheduled at this time. Uh, we will look uh, and evaluate that uh, after the, the DIA cultivator um, application window has closed. As you can see, there, the fees are, are prescribed there. <clears throat> the microcultivator also can supply the medical and the adult use market. They have to be between 2,000 and 10,000 square feet of grow space. Or they may expand to a total of 25,000 square feet in increments of 5,000 square feet annually. Um, if they go or want to go beyond 25,000 square feet, they will have to convert to a, um, a full cultivator. One of the unique parts about the microcultivator is the microcultivator uh, is permitted to deliver adult to adult use consumers, um, but not qualifying patients or caregivers. Um, they can use their employees or a delivery service. Delivery has to cease from that facility once they convert to a cultivator, full cultivator license. Um, and 30 days after the department has issued five delivery services, credentials, uh, the operation of self-delivery has to stop. So the cultivator would have to use a delivery service. As I stated earlier, there's a cap of one microcultivator per 25,000 residents um, in a municipality that permits microcultivators. This limit does expire. And towns and city, cities may have their own specific zoning requirements. Uh, and so while we do have a list um, for zoning, and this will apply to kind of every license type, we strongly suggest that you start communicating with your local municipality uh, as soon as possible to ensure that you will um, have access to the space that you've identified. Microcultivators are permitted to perform um, processing, food and beverage manufacturing, factoring, and packaging functions from their facilities. The fees for the lottery <clears throat> are prescribed in the statute and displayed there. The application window uh, opened for this already uh, for the lottery. It started on February 10th, so we've been operational for just about a week, just under a week now, on taking applications, and it will close on May 11th. The provisional license is, is $500, and there will be some requirements for that that I go over a little bit later, and a final license there. So processing. <clears throat> Um, food and beverage manufacturers incorporate cannabis into food or beverages intended for humans. Um, they may only contain cannabis from other licensed cannabis establishments in Connecticut. They may package and label on their own. They must obtain all other food and beverage required licenses and certifications. They may not sell or deliver directly to consumers, qualifying patients or caregivers. The fees are prescribed below. Uh, of note, the application window is from March 3rd to June 1st. A product manufacturer <clears throat> is slightly different from the food and beverage uh, manufacturers. They can make pills, uh, vapes, tinctures, and topicals. Um, it's not limited to that, but those are just some of the examples. They can perform cannabis extraction, chemical synthesis, and all manufacturing activities, including packaging and labeling of its own products. They may not sell or transfer um, directly to consumers, qualifying patients or caregivers, excuse me. They may only obtain cannabis from other licensed cannabis establishments. Um, they may sell, transfer or transport their own products to cannabis establishments, laboratories or other research programs um, using their own employees or a transporter. As you can see, the fees are or outline there, and that application window is from March 10th to June 8th. 
for the manufacturing, I think it's particularly important to point out that the equipment in those facilities is often highly specialized um, and the cost can be considerable. And some of the, tra the training on the staff may be, um, may be particularly appointed and, and they need to be highly trained. A product packager is a person or is a business that um, produce, that labels and packages products in compliance with federal laws, state laws, and regulations and policies. Uh, they obtain the cannabis from a producer, cultivator, microcultivator, food and beverage manufacturer, or product manufacturer. As you can see, the fees are outlined there. Um, and the application window is March 7th to June 15th. Uh, just of note, some of this equipment can be very expensive both to purchase and, and maintain. And you may require specific personnel to have um, very specific training for that. Sales. So as we discussed before, these are the, the um, registrants that are permitted to sell in, the, in Connecticut. Um, we'll start with dispensary facilities. There are 18 dispensary facility, facilities currently, and they require a pharmacist to be present. They may only sell to qualifying patients and caregivers, um, either directly or through a delivery service, if, if or when the department issues um, five delivery licenses that are operational, self-delivery must cease. And that will happen within 30 days. So we'll be sure to notify our applicants of that. Um, the dispensary facility may deliver directly to qualifying patients and caregivers. Dispensaries may convert to a hybrid retailer license, allowing for sales to the medical and adult use markets without entering the lottery. <clears throat> Um, the retail retailer allows for sales to the adult use market only. They may sell directly to adult use consumers or through a delivery service. There's only one retailer permitted for 25,000 residents in a municipality that permits retailers. Again, this limitation ex expires currently as of June 30th, 2024. Please check with your local town or zoning where you wish to enter or to have one of these establishments to ensure that zoning permits it. The fees for the lottery are, are outlined there and the provisional license and final licensure. Um, the lottery application window was our first lottery to open. It was February 3rd um, and will close on May 4th. And the big differences between, or some of the big differences between the dispensary facility and the retailer is that a dispensary can sell to qualifying patients and caregivers for medical use. No additional dispensary facility licenses will be issued at this time. Um, and existing dispensary facilities may apply to convert their license to a hybrid license for sale to both medical and adult use patients. Retailer can only sell to adult use patients um, and those consumers can have to be over 21. They cannot sell medical marijuana products. A hybrid retail, retailer allows for the sales of medical and adult use. Um, there is no population restriction um, except for the age restriction and the adult use. Um, they may deliver to qualifying patients and consumers either directly or through delivery ser service. And again, we'll have to cease self-delivery 30 days after we have five delivery licenses operation. These facilities also require a farm licensed pharmacist on premises. The facilities also are required to have a private consultation space um, and priority entrance for qualifying patients and caregivers. Hybrid retailers um, cannot convert to a retailer license, but they can convert to a dispensary. For the conversion from a dispensary facility to a hybrid retailer, uh, there's a $1 million fee to do that. Um, that fee is again reduced to 500,000 with evidence of one equity joint venture. <clears throat> uh, for a lottery applicant, the application window starts February 24th and uh, closes May 25th. Um, there is the fees for the lottery are outlined there. And delivery and transporters. Um, delivery always permits delivery to qualifying patients, caregivers, and consumers, depending on the registrants where they're delivering from. 
of the employees must be full time at least 35 hours per week. Uh, there can be no more than 25 delivery employees at any given time. And again, this self delivery by the other establishments has to cease after we have five delivery establishments uh, operational. The big difference between these two credentials is that a transporter is from establishment to establishment. The delivery service can deliver to the end user or the, the final user. The fees are outlined there. The delivery service lottery application window is February 17th to May 18th. The transporter is March 24th to June 22nd. Now we're going to go over to the application process, and some of this is going to feel a little bit duplicative, but uh, just delivering it to you in a different way. So ultimately, there's a number of pathways to licensure. So there's conversion, equity joint ventures, social equity partners, social equity cultivator, um, the social equity micro cultivator assistance program, and the lottery. The social equity cultivator in the, in the disproportionately impacted area has that three month period, $3 million fee. They're subject to a criminal background check and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and the, they have to get approval from the social equity council for, for, to get to the provisional license stage. Equity joint ventures are um, also required to have social equity applicant documentation. They must partner with an existing medical producer or dispensary facility. It must be at least 50% owned by an individual who meets the social equity definition. The social equity council must approve the EJV before it can apply for the provisional license. Um, again, criminal background checks will be done for those. Social equity partnerships are a very unique subset of credentialing. Um, here, they are um, available for producers applying for expanded producer license. It must be 65% owned and controlled by an individual who meets the social equity definition. The producer provides social equity, the social equity partner with 5% of the gross base mentorship overhead costs for five years. The social equity partner gets 100% of the profit from those sales. Um, there's no closing application window for that. that that's an ongoing um, application process. And the, the agreements need to be approved by the council. And then the primary way for the, the applicants to have an opportunity is through the lottery. And there's going to be two lotteries for each credential type. First one will be a social equity lottery and then a general or standard lottery. Um, and 50% of all the licenses issued need to um, be for social equity applicants. So the Social Equity Council has created criteria um, to help determine, the, the Public Act and the Council have, have created criteria to determine social equity status. Some of them are, are outlined here. Um, I would encourage you to review them on the, the Social Equity Council's website to ensure that you provide the, the most complete application information um, as required by the statute and the Council. The department will be collecting this information um, in the application process and, and forwarding it to the councils for review. So for the disproportionately impacted area cultivator, um, it's a three month application period. Um, the provisional license application must be submitted The documentation demonstrating social equity applicant criteria must be provided. Um, a national criminal history background check will have to occur at a point uh, and a payment of the $3 million fee to be deposited in the social equity and innovation fund. Once the provisional license has been granted, um, the applicant must submit pro um, project labor agreements and labor peace agreements um, as applicable. Um, just as of note, um, oh, we'll final license. Once the provisional cultivator license has been issued, the applicant may apply for final licensure. Um, that uh, applicant is going to have to have the final, uh, complete our final application 
Um, they have to have a contract with the electronic tracking system or the seat to sale tracking system. They have to have right to exclusively occupy the location where the cultivation facility will be located, have all necessary local zoning approval and permits, a business plan, a social equity plan approved by the council, written policies and procedures preventing diversion and misuse of cannabis and sales of cannabis to underage persons, and all blueprints of the facility and security requirements. Um, the facility will be subject to an, an inspection um, prior to final approval. Conversion, um, conversion for a hybrid retailer has you know, its own distinct requirements. The dispensary facility may convert to a hybrid retailer license and sell adult use cannabis to consumers over the age of 21 as well as medical marijuana to qualifying patients and caregivers. Dispensary facilities may apply for a hybrid retailer license conversion um, without being subject to the lottery. Hybrid retailer requires licensed pharmacists on premises when open to the public or uh, qualifying patients and caregivers and at least, at least 35 hours per week. Private medical or private consul space, consultation space is required and a priority entrance for these patients um, and a secure location for cannabis that cannot be delivered um, during business hours. <clears throat> uh, they're gonna have to submit a conversion application, medical ca cannabis preservation plan, a conversion fee, depending on if they're participating in an equity joint venture and a workforce development plan approved by the social equity council. Um, the producer also must um, submit a, a, an application to uh, have expanded producer um, functions. Uh, they have, the, there will be an application for it, a medical cannabis preservation plan, a conversion fee, a workforce development plan approved by the Social Equity Council, um, and either the $500,000 fee uh, to the Social Equity Council or evidence of social equity partnership. An equity joint venture. Um, these businesses partner with a less licensed medical marijuana producer or medical marijuana dispensary facility that is at least 50% owned or controlled by an individual or individuals where the applicant is an individual who has had an average a household income of less than 300% of the state median household income over the last three tax years and either was a resident of a disproportionately impacted area for at least five of the last 10 years, or was a resident of a disproportionately impacted area for at least nine years before the age of 18. The social equity applicant, um, a business that applies for a license and is at least 65% owned and controlled by an individual who <clears throat> has had an average household income of less than 300% and has either resided in a disproportionately impacted area for at least five of the past 10 years or nine of the last 18. The social equity partner um, is, is for producers and a social equity um, applicant. They must, the, the producer must provide 5% growth space, mentorship, and all overhead costs for not less than five years and 100% of the profit to the social equity partner. The lottery pathway. The social equity lottery um, is the first lottery that we're gonna run. 50% of the maximum number of licenses allotted for each license type will be reserved for the social equity lottery. Um, applicants not selected in the social equity lottery will be, gen will be automatically entered in the general lottery. Applicants that are selected from the social equity lottery who are not found to meet social equity criteria may enter the general lottery on payment of the fee difference. And they'll have five days to do that. All lottery, all interested individuals who would like to get into the lottery must submit their lottery application and the non-refundable fee. Documentation of the social equity council's requirements will need to be provided in the application. It's important at this point to point out that, um, well, there, there is no benefit to rushing your application and getting it in early. 
but you do not want to wait to the last minute. It's important for your application to be complete as, as complete as possible when you submit it, uh, because that may jeopardize your ability to qualify as a social, social equity applicant. Um, and the complete application also includes the backers. And it's also important to point out that backers are considered individuals, um, not businesses. So each individual that owns greater than 5% of the business or has ownership and control uh, will have to submit the backer license. Those that do not submit that information prior to the closing of the application period may not be included in the information transmitted to the Social Equity Council for a review. The general lottery um, will consist of individuals that have not identified themselves as social equity applicants, those that were disqualified um, and pay the fee difference, and social equity applicants that were not selected to the lottery. Again, there's a lottery application and fee associated with it and um, the fee difference will have to be paid for those social equity applicants that were determined not to meet the criteria. So the provisional license, there are prohibiting conditions that would prevent um, an applicant from moving to the, to the provisional license. If you have a disqualifying conviction, um, those convictions are listed in the cannabis uh, website. So I, we really encourage all applicants to review those before they apply uh, to ensure that they don't have any of those convictions. Um, common ownership, there are um, restrictions in the public act that allow, that prevent two or more licenses and for a single backer that has managerial control um, and is in a similar license category. Generally it's retail and manufacturing or growing. Cannabis business with administrative uh, findings or judicial decisions. Um, so any any of those findings that may um, substantively compromise the integrity of the cannabis program. <clears throat> the provisional license expires 14 months after the issuance and it cannot be renewed. So here's a general reference to the pathway of of licensure. Uh, so once the lottery is run, uh, the DCP will review the applications um, and move them forward. If the applicant, um, applicants that notified that, that their application has a disqualified backer have a very discrete time window to remove that backer and reconfigure their organization. Um, those that are qualified move forward um, and will have 60 days to complete the provisional license application. Um, restructuring gets reviewed and then if it's approved, um, that that 60 day window um, exists. In the provisional licensing, there's certain documentation that will be required and some of it is, is not necessarily um, going to be fully complete at this time because it is a, an early license process. Um, but uh, registrants that have moved into the provisional uh, window will work on a contract with the approved electronic tracking system, maybe have a preliminary um, security plan, initial mock-ups or blueprints of the physical facility, the social equity plan for approval by the council, and a workforce development plan for approval by the council. The final license process involves review of certain components by the Social Equity Council, including the Workforce Development Plan and the Social Equity uh, Plan, if applicable. Um, that documentation and the fees will be submitted, um, and then the, the department will review those um, and perform an inspection of that facility. It's important that um, Applicants that make it to this stage communicate with the department pretty regularly because uh, we'll like to likely want to see the facility in multiple stages of completion. The final documentation um, will be required in order in order to approve any license uh, to to operate in the in the industry. 
They're going to have that have that contract with the approved electronic tracking system. They're going to have the right to occupy the location of the establishment, local zoning approval, labor peace agreement, uh, certification of pro uh, project labor agreement, social equity plan approved by the council, workforce development plan approved by the council, policies preventing diversion, misuse, and underage sales and uh, all of their security requirements and that final inspection. <clears throat> and that concludes my presentation part of the program today. Um, it's always good to point out our the website for where you can get a lot of the information um, from our slides and other knowledge articles that we've put there and uh, emailing questions to dcp.cannabis at ct.gov. Thank you very much, Rod. Um, it is 12.36, and so as we do these Lunch and Learns, we do give an opportunity for folks to ask questions. And I believe Diana, is Diana going to handle the questions um, on your end, Rod? Or? Yeah, I think she's um, either answering them or um, leaving them up for us. So I think the first question um, is what proof of funds, if any, such as an attestation is necessary during the social equity cultivator slash backer evaluation period we are in now. Where did you see that question? And are you asking, can you repeat it? Because I, I actually don't see that. Sure, so if you um, click on the Q&A at the bottom of our panelist screen, you'll be able to see that question in the open question area. Oh, that's why I was not in the open question area. Okay. What proof of funds is only Is that, that's a, that's a DCP question? Um, I believe that question actually more resides with the Social Equity Council, but I believe that the answer is that outside of the $3 million that will be due after the application is reviewed for social equity criteria and for um, the background check uh, portion, I don't believe that funds are required or, or any proof of funds are required. Right. That's good. But we can confirm that, and that, but I don't. I don't believe that Social Equity Council is looking for funds. I know that the DCP is not looking for funds. Right, and we are not either. We're not verifying funds. So the the second question, I'll probably just read this out loud. It's a little long. Um, and hopefully I can answer it for you. So, a section 149 social equity cultivator applicants in a disproportionately impacted area application have changes in the relative ownership percentage of non social equity backers without impacting the review process and or approval likelihood of said applicants. This question is posed with the recognition and within a universe of non-social equity backers not exceeding a 35% ownership interest. As a hypothetical, if a SEA DIA applicant has three backers, A, B, and C, which own 10%, 10%, and 15% respectively, if a transfer 5% to B, does not impact the application, I would assume such a shift in ownership could have to be disclosed to the SEC and the DCP and the Attorney General's office um, as material change. My question is, would such a shift while maintaining the cap of the 35% ownership be non-social, by non-social equity backers impact the application either time for review or viability if um because i'm not asking if backers can be added or the application is submitted but if backers relative 
which is maybe a then it's going to cut some off because it was pretty long. One, so I would say from the Social Equity Council perspective, once the application is submitted, it's submitted. And you should not be changing ownership uh, percentages for anyone regardless. Um, if you're changing the ownership structure, so if you say that the 10%, 10%, the 15%, if A, B, or C, let's say C is the 15%, and then B becomes you are changing the ownership structure because the backer is a different person and may have a different financial structure, may have different um, affiliations. So the, the ownership structure should not be changing once the application has been submitted because it does trigger a different review. Okay, uh, the next question is, if an applicant is deemed eligible based upon 2018, 2019, and 2020 tax returns, and they are selected from the lottery or awarded a Section 149 license, what happens if their 2021 tax return makes them ineligible? It is the tax returns that you have available at the time of submission of the application. So if you submit your 20. 21 tax returns, if you've submitted them already and you have not submitted your application, you must submit your 2021 tax returns with your application. If you have not uh, filed your 2021 tax returns, you don't have them to submit to the, um, with the application. So it's the, it's the most recent tax returns that you have filed. There was a question that I believe was answered, but I think it's good for people to hear in general. Um, there was a question about the vehicle requirements for a transporter and delivery. Um, those, the requirements for all of those vehicles and um, and the security around them are available in the policies and procedures, which are on the department's website um, at cct.gov slash cannabis. Last place is where is the actual application located? I'm interested in micro cultivator license, possible social equity application. And every time I look it up, I can't seem to find it. And Diana is responding. Well, I'll answer that as well verbally. Um, so all the applications are online applications only. They're available at elicense.cp.gov. Um, when you are applying for a business, related license, um, so on any of the licenses we, we really went over today, they will, um, you'll have to register with that system as a business. Uh, so it's a sole proprietor, LLC, et cetera, et cetera. So those are, the applications are all available there. Are, and you, I'm sorry, excuse me, they, um, you can start to create them, you know, at your leisure 24 hours a day. Um, and you can test them and they'll save the information um, that you put in there over time. And so I, we really encourage people to try to test some of those applications and kind of get those requirements. And we put a lot of the requirements um, up on our website, um, both in, in kind of checklists as well as um, demonstration of the application process. Okay, another question is, what Connecticut charter banks deal with cannabis establishments? Um, are out-of-state banks, uh, bank accounts allowed? I would check sure. with the Department of Banking um, for the state chartered banks, and you would have to contact those banks and ask them what their criteria are and what are they doing. Um, and I don't know if out-of-state bank accounts are allowed. That's a good question. So anonymous, this is from anonymous attendee. If anonymous attendee would submit that question to the social equity email address, which is sec at ct.gov, I can um, look that up and, and, and uh, get back to you on that.
And so there is a question also, are the taxes based on an average of over three years? What if one year was over, but the average is under? So the way that I understand that we are calculating this is it's per year. So if you are over in a year, you are over and you would not be eligible. Um, send me that question and I will also get a firm answer, but that is my understanding that if you are over one year, you are not eligible as a social worker. You do not meet the, the uh, income criteria. And again, the, the email address to send that question to is sec at cc dot gov. Um, so Bridget is, will DIA status be determined by the property mailing address or whether part of the property parcel fits within the DIA? So the, the parcel has to be in the DIA. It's not partially in and partially out. It has to be in the DIA. Um, if you want to send the, uh, send the address, our email box. I can I can double check the census tract, uh, but it's either you're in or you're out. And the, and, and I, I mean I I guess it could be too that if the mailing address is in the DIA, I, I guess a, a part of the building could be kind of hanging out, but it would be the actual mailing address that we would be uh, looking at, or physical address that we'd be looking at. Um, a question is coming up about um, people submitting backer applications. Uh, businesses are not considered backers, so it's only individuals. So any individual that meets the definition of a backer is a person with 5% or more um, ownership or uh, control of that business. So individual businesses should not be submitting those applications. Uh, the individuals that own those businesses will have to submit those applications and submit to the background check. This is, um, let's see. If the ownership and control checklist for the social equity cultivator application is bank authorized and signatory cards, does the inclusion of this checklist item mean that an applicant at this stage, social equity qualification, must have a bank account for the applying company? So to, well, just to meet the social equity criteria, you don't have to have a bank account. Um, so you don't, the bank accounts don't qualify for You are a current business owner. Are the taxes based on the net? You, yeah, I don't know if you're talking about your your business taxes that you file, but we are looking at the gross. We are not looking at adjusted. Well, you can, um, you, it says, thanks for the clarification, Janae, on the DIA. However, the maps and the list don't always match. So if you can send me what's not matching, I can help you um, with an answer. But I would say that it's the, it's the census tract that are what we are looking at not just not just the map and the census tracks tracks create the map so it's the actual tracks themselves that would be what you would want to rely on i'll take the next one um once the backers submit their application separately and if approved do we set up a business at that point um you can set up the business at any point that is but 
you have to list the backers that are going to be involved in any business upon the application. You cannot change them down the road. So what happens is when you complete the application, you fill out some preliminary information about your, your backers that you've identified. They will get an email um, to complete the backer application, and then they can submit it. You can file all of the business filings after, but they have to be complete by the time the license is final. But the organizational documents, depending on if you're a social equity applicant, um, those documents need to be established before so the Social Equity Council can review them for appropriateness and, com and compliance with the document. Okay, if the Section 149 cultivator applicant takes a commercial loan, does it have to be disclosed on the Social Equity Applicant Evaluation Application process that we are presently in? We are not looking at loans for social equity applicant qualification. So I'm not quite uh, clear on what your question is, Attorney Kennelly. Um, I'm gonna take the next one. Um, so <clears throat> I think this, you'll find this on a couple of different slides, but can I clarify what was said about the DIA? For cultivator license, we will be able to call the cultivation, manufacturing, and packaging. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure it was said a couple of times on those slides. So you'll have that as a reference as well. Um, will business and operation plans, including financial statements, be required? Um, and if so, at what point? Will this information be needed? So I so as a social equity applicant, we do ask you to show you the business structure, uh, the ownership and control of the business. So your business and operation plans are not necessarily do. There is a checklist of information that you should submit on our on our website. Uh, for ownership and control. So go back to that list and that tells you what you need to submit for social equity applicant um, confirmation and verification. Okay, so if you have more than one social, one qualified social equity applicant under a LLC applying for a micro or cultivator's license, does each social equity applicant have to apply individually? The business applies for the license. Each one of those individuals would have to be uh, considered a backer. And the business plan should outline how that works. There's a question about multiple rounds of lottery for delivery service. Um, we intend to have multiple rounds of lotteries for many, if not all of these credentials, depending on um, a, a variety of factors from need to market saturation and uh, available zoning opportunities. And just uh, uh, attorney Canelli, you said that you didn't hear my response to your question regarding bank accounts for social equity applicants. We are not asking for bank accounts for social to be qualified as a social equity applicant. Please look at our website and look at the criteria for verification for income residency, ownership, and control. And that will provide you all of the information that is necessary for your client to be um, reviewed and verified as a social equity applicant. So Ian Butler asks, um, does the Social Equity Council have guidelines for what kinds of business agreements between the social equity applicant owning 65% and 35% are acceptable or not acceptable. For example, if the 35% owner has a right to buy out the 65% equity owner after three years, holding period expires, what terms is the SEC going to consider to be fair? So the Social Equity Council is not looking um, 
at necessarily at these to determine fairness and or what they need to look like. There is criteria um, that you must, the social equity applicant must own 65% of the business. And Rod, can, do you know if there is a prescribed time that they must own the 65%? Is it for three years? Or is there no time that they must own? I believe it was a three year period, but I'm not sure. I, I It is in the, in I believe it is in the public act though. Okay, that's what I thought. So. Um, I would, Ian, I would most definitely have a conversation with an attorney um, to get out of this agreement that one, that it follows the law, and two, that the social equity applicant is actually engaging in an agreement that they expect and intend to agree to. So I would not do this type of an agreement without having legal representation to protect you and not legal representation maybe from your other, from the 35% owner, get your own attorney for your own portion of the agreement and get out of that agreement what you are expecting to get out of it. I'll take the next one. Um, someone asked, uh, who regulates price since we are only allowed to get our products from Connecticut producers? What stops them from price gouging? Um, so you know, the opportunities of having new growers, manufacturers, and product manufacturers and these different credential types um, should allow for a more traditional market price control. There is no price control in the bill. Um, and so it's, it's really gonna be driven by competition. Um, I I go ahead. No, I was gonna read the second question, this next question about drivers. Yeah, so there, there is no minimum number of drivers for a delivery service. I mean, we've got to have one um, driver, but beyond that, there's no, no restriction. Um, so the question is, uh, if two backers will eventually form the entity, how will you link both if the two um, separate applications are being submitted? So if, so if you submit an application, in that application, you identify your two backers. The backer then will be emailed about the um, backer application. If you then submit another application, those same backers will be able to link to the second application as well. So you only have to fill out one backer application, no matter how many businesses you submit, business applications you submit, um, they can, you can link them back to each individual application that you have. Beyond extensions, completing the 21 taxes, can you use 18, 19, and 20? If you do not have the tax returns and you have not filed them, you cannot use them. So you use the most recent tax, if you're choosing to submit your tax returns, you submit the tax returns that you have available to you. Most recent three years. Yeah, um, Paula says that in the statute, it is seven years that the social equity applicant has to hold 65%. I'm going to, we're going to look that up um, in the statute just to confirm. I, I don't recall it saying seven, but um, I, I don't recall the number. So, it could be seven, but we'll, we'll take a look at that, Paula. There's a question about um, <clears throat> the social equity or, or any of the, the, the next lottery for retail. Um, we have not determined that as yet. Okay. And then the last question, because it is one o'clock, the delivery driver needs a second person as a passenger on all the deliveries. Is that correct? I did, I refer you back to the policies and procedures to confirm that, but uh, you may be getting the answer in, in the chat as well. Okay. well All right, well, thank you, Jenny Ray, for having me. Thank you, Rob, and I want to thank everyone that joined us today. Um, this webinar has been recorded and will be placed on the Social Equity website as well as the DCP website, so you can tell your friends that you
you need to watch it again, you can watch it there. Um, please be on the lookout. We have many of you on a mailing list and we will continue to send you information on the Lunch and Learn. So we're gonna stick with this format. They will be on most likely Wednesdays, maybe some days at 12 o'clock. Okay, so thank you. If you have any questions, or if you missed anything, please feel free. So uh, sec at ct.gov and, and Rob, your email address is? Um, dcp.cannabis at ct.gov. Okay, thank you everyone. Thank you for Take being care. here. Enjoy the rest mm -hmm. of your day.